That's why I wrote the book in part because it helps explain how we got here, right? Because it didn't happen overnight and it, it didn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, people saw what they were able to get away with in 2020 and they were able to get away with a lot, unless you're Kyle Rittenhouse, right? And that took a while for him to get justice done in his, and you know, obviously his life is drastically altered for um, but if you, you know, loot or even if you kill somebody or if you, you know, do major property damage or attack somebody in, in this BLM context, well then, okay, go, go. <laughs> you know, mm. here's, here's the door. And that's just not good because who are the victims of, the, of these crimes, of these violent crimes, these shootings? It's black people. It's brown people. I mean, it's people that are the, the people that, that are supposed to be protected f- by this movement. And yet this movement of this they just they've made things worse and they don't see it or they don't want to see it and so they're going to continue pushing for these radical policies Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by Nick Solheim, the COO of American Moment. And today we have another fantastic episode for you guys on a topic that is near and dear to my heart. It was in many ways the backdrop of uh, the founding of American Moment uh, with someone who was there for a lot of it. Uh, We taped today with Julio Rosas um, and I'll get to that in a second, though. Um, As always, please be sure to go to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find everything else we have cooking, um, backlog of this podcast, programs that we have upcoming, parties coming up, events, and uh, Amcanon, our constellation of books, essays, podcasts, YouTube videos, and short pieces that we put together so that you can understand the issues we care about more. Um, you can also check out the news section where you can find, you know, the hit pieces being written against us on a weekly basis and uh, what we think about them. But Back to Julio. Julio is the senior writer for Town Hall, and he previously worked at the Washington Examiner Media in the Independent Journal Review. Uh, he was also uh, he's also a Marine, but the core reason we had him on is because he was on the ground in basically every single city uh, where there were riots in 2020. He was in Kenosha. He was in Seattle. He was in Minneapolis. He uh, was in Atlanta. He flew all over the country covering on the ground at serious risk to his own life and limb uh, and and getting footage and getting the news about what exactly happened, the complete breakdown of public order in our cities. And so he sold a jillion copies of his book that came out about this called Fiery But Mostly Peaceful, which is a great title for a book. Um, but he uh, he he walked us through um, really in detail what it was like to be in those cities in in Minneapolis and Kenosha specifically. And then a little bit personally for him, what it was like to, uh, you know, go through what is not unlike being in a war zone and and how he's kind of adjusted and and uh and adapted to to being a journalist since then um i thought it was a fantastic episode nick what did you think well you know i was uh it was unfortunate to see um minneapolis fall apart through 2020 i mean i won't pretend like minneapolis is close to my heart because it's a sullen hellhole but um you know i lived in the in the immediate vicinity and i had some friends that 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 lived uh in the area and so um a lot of flashbacks today to uh to you know bad times in in minneapolis and uh you know we greatly appreciate julio's reporting that uh we know everything about it that was going on yeah i mean there is a world where the media could have successfully gaslit voters into thinking that nothing bad happened. It was only because of often conservative, in some cases, you know, more centrist journalists that were willing to actually get down on the ground and show people like, actually, no, like, you know, it's not cool that CVSs are being burned down on a daily basis. So um, we'll go now to Julio Rosas. Julio, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. We always like to hear about how people got to the point where they are today. Uh, why did you end up taking up a career of getting shot at and reporting on the uh, you know decadence of our cities? Uh, it's a bit of a long story, but the, the short the short of it is is that I was working at Turning Point in 2014, 2015, and they had this blog, and I got interested in writing in general, um, working for them on on that project, and in during the twenty sixteen election, I. Uh, for them covered the, the protests at the RNC and the DNC. And so, you know, obviously they weren't um, anything crazy because there was actual police work 
involved to prevent something like that from happening. Um, but I mean, especially because, you know, with Donald Trump becoming the nominee in the RNC, there was kind of that concern, you know, are there going to be like some kind of unruly protests in, in Cleveland? And so uh, just being there and kind of using Twitter to like live tweet it. I mean, this is back when you know I really didn't have much of a following. And so but even still then, I still very much enjoyed kind of that. Uh, kind of aspect of reporting. Um, and so I knew, okay, uh, I like writing, I like the politics, but I also like covering, um, being on the ground, covering when things are a little bit more hectic. And so I didn't really get a chance to immerse myself into that until I, uh, you know, fast forward to when Trump won 2016. And then, you know, seeing that reaction to him winning, uh, you know, I went to a small private Christian college in Indiana at the time, Indiana Wesleyan University. It's a great school. Uh, but, you know, I was seeing on Twitter on election night, uh, you know, students in California and, and New York starting to, pro you know, break out in spontaneous protests and and seeing the, you know, the media have their meltdown. Um, and so I, you know, meanwhile, there was like cheers and, you know, victory parades at, at my school. So, I mean, that was kind of what was, again, the, the, the difference. But I at that point, I, I knew that, OK, well, if I'm going to really, uh, you know, capitalize on this kind of moment that that we're in um i need to drop out of college now and not finish two years later because i still had two more years left so uh, uh spring comes i start applying to fellowships and internships uh, here in the washington dc area and i got one at the independent journal review and so i told my parents i said hey i'm dropping out this is what i'm doing this is what i hope to achieve uh you know obviously you know i understand that it might not be successful but i'm gonna go ahead and try it out anyway and so May of 2017, I moved out of the house and moved here to the D.C. area, and uh, I've been out here ever since. And and then the first kind of really riot type situation I found myself covering was Charlottesville in 2017 in August, and that was just I mean that was crazy on and of itself, but it really did set the tone to kind of how people were going to be reacting to to certain things, and then. Uh, when Town Hall was gonna was hiring me from the Washington Examiner in f the fall of 2019, I said, "Hey, uh, I like covering protests. I like covering riots. So whenever there's an opportunity for us to to go ahead and be there, I want to do that." And they said, "Yeah, absolutely." And then of course 2020 happened, and we kind of definitely got our fair share of of that employment agreement. But that that's kind of how uh, it, it evolved. That's fascinating. So 2020, what's the What's the first shoe to drop? What's what's the first thing that made you realize, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be on the road a lot. <laughs> so it, it wasn't even so it wasn't even when Minneapolis happened because of what what happened to George Floyd. That I I initially thought well, first I thought people were gonna be too scared to gather in groups because this is this is still very much in the early days of the lockdowns of you know with the COVID lockdowns. And so when the when I saw the video with George Floyd, I, I I thought, okay, this is bad, from like from and people are going to be obviously upset, but they're not going to actually do anything because COVID. But then literally that first day, that 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 wasn't the case, in terms of people gathering in in, in large groups. Uh, but so it, when when I went to go cover Minneapolis uh, in in those early days, I just initially thought, okay, I'm going to go cover this, and then I'm it's going to be over at some point and then I'm just going to go back. I was staying in Los Angeles at the time. So I'm going to go back to Los Angeles and then that'll be that. Like I, I, I literally thought that it was just going to be Minneapolis, maybe a few other cities would experience their, their time of, of riots. And then, and then we'll go back to being talking about COVID. But then um, it really wasn't until I got back from Atlanta. So I, covered Minneapolis, went back to Los Angeles, Chaz happened. And I actually, so I went there to, to cover that whole situation. And then from Seattle, I went to Atlanta to cover, uh, but there were, there were no major riots. There were major protests, but there was no major riots in Atlanta by that point. But it wasn't until I got back to DC, literally the day I got back f from Atlanta. And that's when uh, rioters tried to take down the Andrew Jackson statue outside the White House. And just again, it, it just seemed like it was like just happening all over again because DC had its own kind of few days of, of riots and looting and, and mass destruction. And so it was at that point where I kind of, and this is in mid July, that's when I thought, okay, like this is still happening. This is still, you know, people's automatic response to anything 
uh, when it comes to you know racial justice or racial equities, we're going to just start going out and start breaking stuff and start setting things on fire and attacking police officers. It was when um, I, I was going to be in it for for the long haul, and I was pretty tired yeah. <laughs> by that point. And and it, these things are still happening. You unlocked like a a key memory for me here that I had forgotten about, which was the the selectiveness with which advice about you know covid and mass gatherings was was given yeah. uh i'm remembering now i don't I, I think i saw like several different cases of it but it's like yes you know don't don't go to thanksgiving don't have fourth of july you know celebrations but um if you're gonna go you know protest or go to an astroturf protest that's totally fine just wear your mask under your chin or whatever the rule is I, that yeah and that's when so the so that's when i really knew that the whole covid uh theater was 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 a farce i mean because I, I know a lot of people like that i know for a lot of people that's when they that's when they really started to like wake up to that but for me especially because i was the one going on planes i was the one being in the crowd mm -hmm. and i wasn't being scolded necessarily for 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 being there for violating the covid you know i was within six feet of people i wasn't wearing a mask all the time um and so you know, but they would have no issue with me being that. But then a couple months later with with Thanksgiving, no, I couldn't do that. You know, where I would yeah. be around significantly fewer people, even with going from across the country mm -hmm. in an airport. I'd be around literally just my immediate family. It's um, almost like they wanted the violence. <laughs> I mean, in in some ways, yes, because they, they that was their, like I said, that was their reaction to get something, you know, to get that initial... Um, uh, way to to get their point across right and that's what was really disturbing about everything Ob obviously not just about like the immediate you know hey we're going to start doing all we're going to start burning these small businesses down but it was it was the, the it, like the pain was the point like we're we know that this is going to cause a lot of problems for people who had nothing to do with george floyd or mm -hmm. uh, jacob blake or rayshard brooks or you know any of those cases but we're still going to do it anyway because this is what needs to happen in order for what we believe the, the necessary changes are to be made and that was you know and obviously not just with the COVID hypocrisy but that was you know the 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 problem with this whole idea of not just racial equality right i mean that like that's good but then it's like we're going to take a step further with this idea of racial equity and it's like okay well, what does that mean and, and in their view it's like well it means all these kind of radical changes that in, in the long run don't actually help the people yeah. that they say that it's supposed to help and and so you know at, at the time you know i knew that you know I, I wasn't thinking about that i was just thinking about going from place to place and just making it through the night but as as time went on and, and again kind of looking at the broader picture and seeing like okay where are we going with this it was obviously nowhere nowhere good and where we are today with you know not to get too far ahead but with like the crime that we're seeing in american cities i mean that was just i mean that there was no other option but to be here now and obviously that's not a good spot to, to be in I want to hear some vignettes about what it was concretely like on the ground in each of those cities you mentioned you were in in those early days. What was it like when you touched down in Minneapolis? What did you see? Well, so it was funny because right the night before I was supposed to go to Minneapolis, I was talking to Nick mm -hmm. because he because he knew because he knew I was going, and so he you know him being a, a native to to to, to that region. He he was he. I mean, you were. I mean, you were just like f dumbfounded, as as was I, about how much, you know, how many things were being set on fire and all these other mm -hmm. places and how just how chaotic it was. And so I, I remember telling Nick, I'm like, Nick, do you do you know anybody that lives there? Because like <laughs> I I don't even know. Because I was concerned. Like, are they going to shut down the airport? Like, I mean, are they going to? If I get there, is like Uber going to be running? It wasn't, by the way. Like, I, and so he hooked me up with. Uh, with with a friend of his and and you know that that was like super helpful because I mean that was I know it's kind of like a first world problem to complain about but I mean it, it really showed just how far things had degraded especially in Minneapolis where public transportation I mean not forget like Uber and taxis but even just public transportation just was not running the mm -hmm. what, what's that what's that uh, the, like the the rail the, the rail. metro rail yeah, yeah the metro rail yeah. that wasn't running as as far as as far as I know and so 
uh, you, you know, me not knowing exactly the, the geography of, of Minneapolis, I got a hotel in downtown thinking it was going to be the safest part of the, of the city. But, <laughs> but, but, but most of, but, but most of the action was happening was in South Minneapolis. And that was a three mile walk from, uh, from where I was staying. And so, uh, the next morning, you know, obviously I didn't want to bother uh, his friend too much. And so I just decided, okay, well, screw it. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna have to hoof it. And, and this is of course already after a day of being on my feet and already just, um, I got super thin in 2020. <laughs> that, 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 that was the best workout regimen I'd ever been in. Um, I've been trying to get back to that. But so that, again, that, that just shows just how, how just like the basic tenets of what we know to be a civilized society, especially in the United States, was just not there. Right. And then even, um, I mean, people who normally wouldn't loot, right? So obviously you had the people that were just like right away going to take advantage of this of this power vacuum because the only law enforcement presence for days in South Minneapolis was they were all confined to the third precinct because they 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 were basically surrounded uh, the the police officers and so there's what caused that just people being out just people because uh, that first day they broke into the motor pool they were breaking into the, the squad cars they were breaking the police officers personal vehicles and actually i later found out that the third precinct as was kind of standard practice back then uh they didn't keep their shotguns in the armory after after their shift you know they would take the take the shotguns into the vehicles and then bring back they would actually keep them permanently in the squad cars and so they were when they were breaking into the squad there was massive concern like oh shoot mm -hmm. they're gonna start taking our shotguns and using against us so uh from from day one after that video they they were just under siege uh at the third precinct and so with that going on you know there was no one to stop the looters and riders from um taking stuff from the target taking stuff from the small businesses in the immediate vicinity and so that and what was the state of minnesota's gun laws were people it, you know, small business owners in that town able to protect themselves, or no, absolutely, they they could. It's just that it happened so quickly in the immediate vicinity of, from the third precinct is that they just didn't have time to they just didn't have time to repair as as time went on and the other surrounding businesses on Lake Street because there that was kind of the main business uh, area for for South Minneapolis. There were, and actually I write about it in the book. There were uh, there's there's an intersection and it was a Latino grocery store. Uh, a taco, two taco stores, and then a, a Latino bakery, a Mexican bakery, and they did I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, yeah, yeah Lake and uh, some I, I forget what street. Yeah, is, yeah, but, but yeah. it's on Lake Street, and and Lake Street got hit super hard because after uh, the third precinct was burned, uh, there was no police presence at that point. Mm -hmm. I mean, even, as marginal as it was, there was yeah. now there was zero, and so so as they were going down Lake Street to get to the fifth precinct. They were breaking off and looting different mm -hmm. places, but that intersection was largely spared because similar to the rooftop Koreans in the Los Angeles riots in 92, there was rooftop Latinos, which which I think was pretty cool, but they, they literally had to... I think you mean rooftop Latinx? Yeah. I'm going I'm going to hurt you really bad, Nick, so help me. No. <laughs> um, yeah, surprisingly, they didn't call themselves out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so there, there was kind of... So, you know, and that was kind of the purpose of writing the book because there were kind of success stories in the midst of all this kind of mm -hmm. chaotic um just sadness i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of heartbreak um and what would the looting of like non retail stores i mean like a taco store what were they looting just the cash register or what were they yeah looting? yeah they i mean in that situation because like so the gro so i interviewed the owner of the, of the grocery store and he was saying that before they were able to set up their defenses they they got broken into they, they took the cash register they they took some odds and ends uh the funniest part was he said that they uh they when things started happening they the the family took everything out of the safe so the safe was empty well the looters that came in later that night they didn't know that and so they spent all this time and energy <laughs> lugging this giant safe out of the store and they took it they did take it and then you know presumably they're going to spent a lot of time and effort breaking into an empty safe so he thought that was pretty funny but so yeah i mean that's the thing and it wasn't even you know obviously there's no tvs or gaming systems to, to loot inside of a small business restaurant but people just wanted to break things mm -hmm. and that's what i was saying earlier where it was that they thought it was righteous because well we're breaking things so that social justice can <laughs> all this change can yeah. can happen in, in honor of george floyd and, but, do, but do you think that's actually true like worthy really just like criminal elements in these protests 
were they motivated by ideology at all or was it just any excuse to act like animals i i think i think i think it was absolutely mm-hmm. um maybe not all of it and maybe obviously it just depends on the person to varying degrees but obviously they were they were the the, the spark was what happened to george floyd well and that's the thing too about lake street that you know, a, lo- a lot of people thought these protests were going to, you know, do something for racial equity and justice. But anyone that's been, you know, up and down Lake Street knows that a majority of those businesses are like minority owned businesses. Yeah. How how are a lot of those people impacted? What do their lives look like now? Do they still have those businesses? Have they rebuilt? So there were over 500 businesses, and I, I believe that's between Minneapolis and St. Paul, that were heavily either heavily damaged, looted, or, or completely destroyed. I mean, there was even, I mean, that was the other thing, too, because I remember uh, on Lake Street, there was a Native American kind of association that had to, that also had to take up arms, you know, shotguns and what have you to protect mm-hmm. from, because there was a different Native American nonprofit close to the third precinct that got completely burned down right mm-hmm. i mean you want to talk about i mean we're not even talking about a black owned business we're talking about native americans and, yeah. <laughs> and, and you know they've been through enough already right so it's just they they i mean from the people that i, I talked to for, for the book they they were just very obviously upset at what happened because it went on for so long um the 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 grocery store owner he stayed in the grocery store for a total of i believe 10 11 days because he 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 didn't want to leave. He didn't, like he, he slept there. He slept everything. there. Yeah, he slept there. He st- he stayed there all the the entire time. Obviously, and he was with other people mm-hmm. too. And they took shifts, but they they were there for even long after uh, the riots had officially had died down. So uh, that 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 was the that was kind of the, the the frustrating part was you know when we talk about when you talk about business owners and you talk about, hey, this is what happened to them, and, you know, the, the, the reflexive response from from these progressives and, and radicals is like, well, it's just a building. There's insurance. You know, you didn't get killed or, 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 what, or what have you. And it's like, okay, well, first off, that's not how insurance works. Yeah. Uh, and as I later can, found... Can you say more about that? Like, why is it that that's not how insurance works? Because it's just so, one of the dumbest memes that was going around. So, so I, I found out that a lot of insurance companies, they don't cover that type of damage to 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 their businesses or property because they they classify that under terrorism yeah i didn't have george floyd insurance <laughs> yeah they should have right but and they and so because unless you're in you know like the the world trade center or, or the, the you know the sears tower you're not going to have that type of insurance right especially if you're a small business because yeah. that's just another expense that you have to you have to make Especially given the 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 lockdowns that were happening, yeah. that were already you know hitting their hitting their bottom line. Well, and if you own like a taco stand, like why would you have terrorism, ter- terrorism insurance? insurance. You know, you know. Exactly, and and so they um, so so even if you have the insurance, I mean that 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 is going to take a significant amount of time, and that's time that these businesses don't really have to to make it through, um, especially especially if it's completely destroyed, if it's gone. It, um, so, so one, that's just not how insurance works. But also, too, we're not talking about. So obviously, am I concerned about Target? You know, because they're, you know that Target was looted, and and, and uh, you know, am I concerned about their if they're going to make it? No, they'll probably they'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, as as you were saying, like the vast majority of the of the places that were damaged or destroyed uh, or you know set on fire, they weren't major corporations that are just easily able to bounce back. They they were mm-hmm. small businesses. And and so I mean now um I mean it was weird because I went back to Minneapolis in September of twenty twenty to kind of see how things were moving along and, and for research. And I mean it was just kind of weird seeing all the empty lots uh, that had been cleared away. There's still a lot of places at that time that hadn't been cleared away. It was just still piles of rubble. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I and found, those buildings were reduced to rubble because of fires. Or? Yeah, yeah, fires. Yeah, that that were completely burned out. Uh, I, I also found out that it, the Minneapolis City Council eventually kind of waived it, but because since a lot of these buildings were older, they had to be cleared by. Uh, they had to pay like a special service to clear because it's like technically like biohazard at that point or or it's like oh because like asbestos and stuff, asbestos like. stuff like that yeah so that's so you can't just pay for regular clean you have to pay for an extra and oh and then also you also had to pay you had to finish your property taxes for that for that year or something and obviously they're like well, with what money we, we don't have, we're not yeah. making yeah, money pro- anymore. Pro- property taxes so they, they designed have, to pay for 
public safety. <laughs> so they eventually waived that, the city council, but for a while that was in place. So mm-hmm. people couldn't clear out their they didn't because they didn't have the money to clear that out. So that was so it was just it was just interesting to see kind of the bureaucracy that was further beating down <laughs> on on these on these people who, who are just trying to, you know, make a living. Um, so yeah, I get really frustrated when I hear people say, Oh, it's just insurance. There's insurance. There's property. It's just property. It's like, these are, this is how people live and you're, you're taking away their ability to live. So you're not, you're not exactly, you know, you're not exactly killing them outright, but you're also not helping them avoid, um, starvation or something. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. What eventually was the cause of the riots dying down in Minneapolis? Uh, they uh, am I able to swear? I'm not, sure. Well, we'll bleep it out. Yeah. Okay, well, it's just because the Minnesota and Minneapolis finally got their <laughs> together. Yeah. I mean, it took it took a super long time, and I, I do extend a little bit. I, I know my, it sends a little bit of grace to the city officials because this is the first time there had been riots on this large scale. Even with Ferguson, it didn't get as bad as it did in Minneapolis. Also, because I mean, Ferguson's smaller. But I mean, the, mo- the 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 most recent comparison is Los Angeles in in 1992, um, and that's a long time from now. So you know, people retire. You know, plans change. So the bureaucracy, and so we, you know, the the response was inept. Like, mm-hmm. don't, don't get me wrong, but it was in part because nothing like this had happened in a very long time. Mm-hmm. Now that I don't extend that same kind of you know leeway to say, example, you know, with what happened in Kenosha. Because by then we're in August, late August. There had already been multiple riots. There had already been multiple, you know, pro, you know, protests and people causing havoc and and yet even still the National Guard. It took a very long time for a big enough response to be mobilized by the Wisconsin National Guard. And I, you know, I'm not blaming obviously the the sergeants and the privates um, and specialists. I'm, I'm blaming you know the governor because mm-hmm. uh, at the time, uh, by the time I got to Kenosha to cover that. That it it, it would took about till midnight till there was about 150 National Guardsmen, which was not nearly enough to to help t- clamp down on what was happening. And so then that's why the next day there was still more stuff happening. And then which, you know, that power vacuum led to the Cal Rittenhouse situation. Um, and so it wasn't until, you know, the week after everything had fun, there was thousands <laughs> of National Guard, which is like okay, like, it's great, but everything's done now. So you're kind of wasting time and 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 the governor governor Evers was saying oh well you know the, the 150 is all we had for a rapid response and that still took a lot of time and and I'm thinking okay but again Minnesota is literally right next door to you guys i mean you you know how crazy things can get like you should have been a lot more prepared than what than what you guys were actually able to muster on such short notice um so in, in terms of what finally got things to simmer down just across the country i i kid you not it was it was the weather it was fine it was finally just because it got just too cold um and and upper midwest coming in clot (laughs) (laughs) so i I, because because there was another case i i don't i can't remember it was 2020 or 2021 but it it was the first time a minnesota uh uh, minneapolis police department killed somebody uh since george floyd Mm-hmm. So obviously, right away, people were like, "Okay, let's let's let's, let's go again. Let's go yeah. again." Uh, but it was the dead of winter, and the only and, and I saw the live stream. The only time there was a, any fire of any kind was just in the middle of the street, so that the protesters could keep warm. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's what I'm saying. So, I mean, literally, by the saving grace of of, of winter coming, um, that's the only reason why things finally died down. And then, um, obviously, it kind of a little changed a little. Uh, January 6th was was in, that just that was the weirdest ride I ever covered. I mean, just in my time. But it was also one of the reasons why it was weird because it was strangely kind of warm. I, I know it's DC and like, we, you know, we don't exactly have like Chicago or Minneapolis winters. Mm-hmm. But I just remember kind of how warm it, it was. It was it was for being early January. So I thought I thought that was kind of weird. But yeah, I mean, there there were times where I thought something might happen, but then it was just because, you know, dead of winter. Be careful. Don't get subpoenaed now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, so when, you know, really quick about that, I, when I went in, so I went to the rotunda on January 6th because people had already broken into, and because and, and I, I saw the news that someone had gotten shot. So I thought, okay, well, I really have to get inside. So, you know, I did my thing, you know, obviously you know, I was, I was pressed. I had, you know, my media, I had my Capitol Hill media badge on me. So I thought, okay, I should be fine. But then the next day when, you know, when like 
I had finally processed, okay, what really happened, and people were, you know, losing their minds over what happened. Um, I was really concerned. I was thinking, oh shoot, is the FBI gonna just knock down my door <laughs> or like or something? But then, you know, nothing, nothing happened. Like I wasn't. I've flown a lot with no issues. You know, I wasn't put on a no fly list. They, they, the FBI has used my video to indict people just because, you know, I was there recording what was happening. Yeah. So and you were like posting it. Yeah, right? yeah was, so they took it from. Yeah, online. yeah. So, so they, the FBI knows I, they're acutely aware that I was there, but they thankfully um, know that I was obviously there as, as media, yeah, not so, not as uh, somebody who just. So we we can come back to that, but I do want to go back to the Kenosha thing. You know, any opportunity to talk about yeah. the about Kyle Rittenhouse uh in that whole situation so you were um <coughs> excuse me sorry um you were there before everything went down give us the give us the play-by-play -play of of kind of your experience in Kenosha pre and and post the shooting so like I said so there was sort of that night of riots uh the previous day they had put up uh, during the day, they had put up a fence around the Kenosha County Courthouse because that that was the that was that rioters' main target was the the Kenosha County Courthouse because the Kenosha PD was also close by, uh, their their headquarters. Um, so during the day, it was just clean up. Uh, nothing nothing was really happening, and then it got to nighttime, and there was a big protesting crowd that was marching around the city, and then they made their way back to the Kenosha County Courthouse. And so now they're confronted with this fence, so they can't easily attack uh, the building or the or the or the sheriff's deputies. And so people started to, uh, so there was no law enforcement or national guard within the perimeter. They were all inside the building, so there was nothing to like provoke them in their minds, right? From mm -hmm. from from law enforcement. Of course, that didn't stop uh, the people. So they started to they they tried to take down the fence. Um, they were they were shaking it, and they actually came pretty close. They came pretty close to to taking it down. Uh, but so obviously once. The officers realized what was happening. They then they then started to come out to get them away from the fence. You know, firing flashbangs, firing firing tear gas, and and uh, shooting uh, pepper balls at the crowd. And so that kind of took them away from the fence. But they were still in the park across the street. And so they you know they were just kind of causing havoc. And so they finally uh, the, the the officers came out from behind the fence. They started pushing people out of the park. And so that was. As good as an idea that was, the issue is they, and again, I don't know why, I don't know if it's because they didn't have the numbers or they just didn't want to do it. Um, they pushed everybody out of the park and down the street, but there was no other law enforcement to kind of intercept them from going any further. So they just kept getting pushed further and further, further down the street into this group of armed civilians that were out there protecting private businesses they were also trying to protect the gas station now we didn't know this at the time uh but thankfully one of the smart things the kenosha city officials did was they turned off the pumps mm. to the gas station in the immediate vicinity but we didn't know that so we were still kind of concerned that if they set this on fire or if they're taking gasoline and set more things on fire then this like these things can get pretty bad uh so that's why yeah gas station catching fire that that explosion kills a lot of people if it right right you know. right exactly so uh we were still so they were still on the assumption and i was and of course I, at the time i i i didn't i wasn't thinking about that i was thinking like oh hey they're at the gas station i'm gonna walk on over there <laughs> um so but that's why that's why they were out there because they wanted to prevent more damage from from being done the the armed civilians so obviously this crowd of rioters that wanted to keep on riding, they weren't too happy with this crowd of civilians with guns preventing them from doing that. And they were saying, they, they, the, the, the armed civilians were telling them, hey, we support your right to protest. We're just not going to let you burn anything down. And, and that pissed off a lot of people within the rioters because, you know, that's what they do. Uh, I did not see Rittenhouse in that, in that crowd uh, before the shooting. I, however, I, that's when I did see Joseph Rosenbaum the the first guy that Rittenhouse shot in self defense, um, he he was just being super aggressive. I mean, he was going up to people. He he was I, I got him on a video saying the n word, <laughs> you know, shoot me, you know. And, and at first, I just thought, oh, this is really funny. We have this short, bald white guy just saying, just slinging the n word around <laughs> at these other white people at a BLM riot. And, and I'm very surprised that no one in the rioting crowd like tried to take him away because I think it was just because they knew that he was very very violent 
the the armed civilians in their attempt to try to de-escalate the situation they moved across the street to a different gas station so they were trying to separate themselves from 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 the rioters to prevent someone from being shot the police came further down further down the road they they pushed them a little bit further back and then at that point i thought things were done i thought things had you know was, people had left by then there wasn't that much going on and then all of a sudden we hear gunshots f- further down the street and the, there was there was no police presence further further down further down Sheridan Road that was that was the road and so me being myself i thought okay well i'm going to go towards where those gunshots are coming I'm gonna from run toward the gunshots. i'm going to run toward the gunshots and surprisingly other people in the crowd also were running to, uh, towards the gunshots and that's what stuck out to me because we have you know i'm running down the street other people were running down the street and then I see this one person running up the street and that's and I mean that's how I knew right away like okay that's that's weird that's different and it was a guy in a green shirt white hat and then that's when I saw he had a rifle I'm like okay let's see what happens with here and then as he was passing by me and then I started to change my direction to kind of follow him um I could hear then people shouting like he shot somebody he shot somebody get him get him get him and so that's when I started recording and then that's when I saw uh, uh, someone hit Rittenhouse from behind, and that I, that's what I think caused him to kind of stumble and lose his footing. And then that's when Anthony Huber, the guy with the skateboard, came up and tried to hit him, or he did hit him. Uh, but then you know there was that struggle with the rifle really quick, and then there was more gunshots. And so I started, I started, I started back way. So during that whole time, I was never concerned that Rittenhouse was going to start randomly shooting people. My concern was with people fighting over a rifle during the situation that. People were gonna accidentally start shooting it in mm-hmm. in that in that shooting struggle, and you know it's like going in all these different directions. And so my main concern was getting shot accidentally, yeah, because people are fighting over it. Did you start wearing a bulletproof vest before this or after this? Uh, no, no, no. I so I started. So I got a ballistic vest after I got shot with the rubber bullet by the Minnesota State Police in Minneapolis. So I so but but the problem was, I opted to wear. A vest that was rated for handguns because at the time I was thinking, well, uh, you know, my main concern is getting shot with police riot control mm-hmm. munitions. So, you know, I, you know, because if you're gonna wear rifle plating that that's heavier, and I'm, you're, I already have my backpack with all my stuff, and so I'm, I was trying to save weight. I was trying to make myself more mobile and just make things easier myself. Mm-hmm. So at the time, and when when the, this Rittenhouse shooting happened, I was only wearing body armor for. For handguns, not rifles or shotguns from the good old boys from <laughs> the 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 countryside of Wisconsin, because I was again mostly thinking about I was, I'm going to be in the inner city most of the time, mm-hmm. and if there is gunfire, it is going to be mostly nine millimeter you know ha- handgun calibers. Uh, so post Rittenhouse, that's when I finally upgraded to to rifle level four uh, ceramic <laughs> rifle plates. Um, but so so that was so that was my other concern too. It was like, well, shoot, if I if 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 it shoots me in the vest area, I, that's still not going to do anything. It's still just going to go right through. So I I, I was backing away. Uh, so there was there was the Sheridan Road where everything was happening. There was a side street that I was on, and then there was another road right behind me. Um, the road right behind me, people, other people, I don't know who to this day, but they were doing drive by shootings. They were just shooting randomly out the out the cars there as they were just driving by. So I have this shooting in front of me i have this shooting behind me and there's no place for me to go for a solid like 10 15 seconds i'm just thinking like what where what am i doing <laughs> like where do i go i mean what do you do in that situation and so the, the other kind of funny anecdote about that i had taken my my ballistic helmet off mm-hmm. prior to all this because again i thought things were done and so i'm recording with my dominant hand and i had clipped my helmet to my right hand side and so as I'm trying to record this whole thing that's happening in front of me, I'm trying to like reach over with my left hand to unclip my helmet. And because, you know, adrenaline's running and I'm doing so many things at once, I, I just couldn't get my helmet unclipped. So during that whole time, my head was exposed. And I'm just thinking, like, if I swear, if I get shot because I don't, <laughs> in the head, because I don't, I don't, I can't get it off my, my side to put it on. Like, I'm going to be, like, I'm going to be pissed. So thankfully, obviously, that didn't happen. So, but it, the thing that people really don't understand with that whole situation was that there was just so much shooting going on. It wasn't just Kyle. Um, once everything was done on both streets, I was trying to find Shelby Telcott, 
who was with who was at the Daily Caller, uh, and so she was closer to where the first shooting had taken place because Richie McGinnis, who also mm-hmm. with the Daily Caller, he was right behind Joseph Rosenbaum when Rosenbaum rushed Rittenhouse. So I was trying to get to them, and so because by that point police had finally come down the street to tend to the third guy who was shot uh, in the in the in the bicep. So I was like, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna say, forget that. I'm gonna go on the side street. And as I was going down the side street, there's like about 10, 15 more gunshots from I don't know where, I don't know from who. Um, and police started swarming that area, and so I was trying to get through to get to Shelby and so I was saying hey hey I saw the second shoot like I saw the shooting I saw the shooting and so they 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 brought me into the police perimeter I I gave them my my information and I told them hey like it's already on Twitter so just look on Twitter but then they they didn't they didn't let me out on the way that I wanted to get out they let me out on another on the way that I came in so I'm just thinking okay so I had to literally double back and so but I mean even even with that whole situation from just from the get go you know, so obviously I didn't know what happened in the first half, but in the second half, I could clearly see this guy was running away. He was trying to get away from these people who were clearly out to get him. He didn't start shooting until he was attacked after he fell down. So I, I could make the case easily that at least in the second half, from what I knew, this was self-defense, mm-hmm. just clear cut. But again, there was so much, there was so much that was happening, and still trying to digest it all. Um, it wasn't clear to me in in that moment, and like I said, I wasn't scared of him. I was just like just randomly shooting people, but I just you know I was trying to like look at and see what what had happened. And then in the you know in the morning after, as I was trying as we were putting the pieces together, because by that point Richie had spoken to the police, he he was back, and and um we we got you know we were getting lunch, and so we were we were like putting the pieces together, and that's when it became clear like oh shoot this guy like. This guy shot in self-defense, but by that point, I mean it was. It, I mean, Ion Presley. I still remember. I wake up the next morning and I see Ion Presley tweet that a seventeen-year-old white supremacist you know, went to yeah. go shoot. I'm just thinking, or white supremacist, like terrorist, and I'm just thinking, like you don't even know who he is. We don't even know who this guy is yet. Like, we yeah. have no idea what his background is. All we know is is that it's a white kid who shot three other white people. Yeah, worst white supremacist terrorist. I, it, it, <laughs> I, it, he had ample opportunity to mow down all these other black and brown people that were also in the crowd, but he didn't do that. And so, I'm, so my my regret, my regret with that situation is that I wasn't more outspoken about what I saw and just laying out the facts of what happened, just because I wanted to make sure, and it was because I wanted to make sure I got it right because because there was so much. Just the, the the political rhetoric around it and and the the hyperventilation uh, about about this case, I I was just concerned that you know if I'm gonna put myself out there, I gotta make sure that I got everything correct on my end, right? Because I yeah. can't I can't let my own personal bias cloud my judgment like that. But just looking back at it, I was thinking, man, I should have just been more outspoken about it because again, I could have at least made it clear this is what I saw. But I just wanted to I just wanted to make sure I was right. But I think, um. I should have just had more trust in myself yeah. because the, the gaslighting about that whole situation was so strong that even though I was there, I was kind of gaslit myself by saying, oh, did I, okay, but did I really, is that how I really saw, even though I had it on video, it, yeah. was, it was ridiculous. Well, that's the thing is he was slandered almost immediately. I mean, yeah. the next day, you know, all you guys that had seen it were still putting the pieces together and Black Rifle Coffee was already like... <laughs> We disavow, you know, he's terrible. And I think I think a lot of conservatives, and I mean, there, there are a ton of conservative organizations. They know who they are. They know they're guilty of doing this. Um, I don't need to name names. You know who you are. Uh, who, you know, immediately in, in the aftermath, they saw people like Ayanna Presley saying, you know, this was a white supremacist. And they're like, well, well, we don't want to be, we don't want to be called that. Yeah, Therefore, that guy is, is yeah. bad. We hate him. He's terrible. <laughs> Anyway, you just you just got me on my yeah. well, know. and so that's why as much as the tr- as much as his trial as much as his trial should not have happened, I am glad it did because it laid and I covered it. I, I went mm-hmm. to Kenosha to to cover it, um, and it, but it just laid everything out in plain view. Oh, it was very clear, and it was yeah. and it, it was so ridiculous. On again, seeing the media coverage about like how sympathetic it was to to Gage Grosskreutz, the third guy who was about to shoot Rittenhouse. Um, and, and to how they were just, again, the framing of, of their stories. And so the casual observer was thinking, okay, the, the prosecution has 
a case. Maybe not a strong mm-hmm. case, but they have a case. And the best example I have of that, during their opening arguments, uh, Binger, the assistant district attorney, I mean, the fact that it was being handled by the assistant district attorney was, I mean, red flag number one. Because if this was a slam dunk case, it would have been the district attorney. He's He made the case... Or he made the case in his opening argument by saying, well, actually, it was Rittenhouse who chased Rosenbaum first. And that's why Rosenbaum then chased Rittenhouse to then lead Rittenhouse shooting him. Even though, and I, I remember thinking, like, really? Like, wh- like what video? Because by that point, I had seen a ton of video. And I was thinking, like, all the videos that we have point to Rittenhouse being chased first, which is what happened. So then fast forward to the closing argument. And Binger didn't even touch that because, again, the videos didn't show that. They then were saying, well, actually, based on this heavily pixelated zoom-in photo, you can make out a silhouette of Rittenhouse pointing a gun at Rosenbaum, which then caused Rosenbaum to chase after Rittenhouse. So, I mean, so at that point, I knew it was over. Like, I, I just I just knew that the, the, they had no case. They just the the shady stuff that they were pulling with uh not giving all the evidence to the defense team and it was just really ridiculous <laughs> i mean the, I, I still remember when binger questioned when rittenhouse was on the stand was saying is is your is this your tiktok account four doors more horrors so like, <laughs> like, what are we doing and and then he was like and you play call of duty right and rittenhouse is like, yeah he's like, and you shoot people in call of duty right and he's it's a video game and I, so is it like every other man that age in america yeah you know? and so it was just I, I, and i remember and i because you know me being me i was in i was i wasn't in the courtroom every day so I was in the media room downstairs in the basement of the courthouse, and every and every day I was just, I was just saying out loud like this is like this is nonsense, like this is so stupid. And then of course you know all the other media reporters, you know, were had their own kind of thoughts about it. But I was, but I kept saying like I was there, <laughs> like, like this is like this is just so dumb. But again, the reason why I'm glad it happened because it just it just laid everything out, and so. Yeah. You you cannot go in there with an open mind and then leave by saying oh yeah oh, yeah you know so it it was it was a whole thing four yeah. doors more horrors four doors more <laughs> I forgot about that yeah and he and he had to say and he had, yes yeah, like that that's my yes that sir that's me. Me. that's my <laughs> TikTok account um the element to this that I think has caused the longest term cascading effects has the effect that has been the effect that all of this had on law enforcement yeah. can you walk us through what that's like, what your experience talking to police officers has been over the last two years, what's happened to their morale, what's happened to the resources they have, what are the laws like in these cities now? Tell me the story. So it's very similar to what's happening right now on the border, which I have extensively covered since since the riots. And it's very similar to, to Border Patrol in that they're demoralized, they're understaffed, they, they can't do their jobs effectively enough. Um, and obviously it's happening for different reasons uh, between the Border Patrol and just law enforcement within the United States. But um, I mean, I was in uh, I was in Chicago covering shootings over the Fourth of July weekend because, again, I'm a normal person. <laughs> uh, but it, it was that all they are in, in a lot of these cities, um, but in Chicago particularly, is, is that they're just bas- the cops are just basically janitors. They just clean up afterwards, and they. Uh, and, and even in just the weekend, just the weekend that I was there. So I was there from Friday to, 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 to Monday. There was one officer who shot in line of duty and then there was one officer who took her own life just in that weekend. And then in the month of July, total three officers total had committed suicide because uh, they're it's being compounded. Obviously not just what's happening on the street, but it's being compounded by the fact that because they're so understaffed, uh, they are on 12 hour shifts. They don't have days off. They, uh, you know, maybe if they were on a specialized uh, task force for gangs, guns, drugs, no, that's gone because because they need so many, cause since they don't have enough street cops, they they get thrown out into the street. And so, I mean, they they are within the Chicago Police Department. They, it's 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 tough. I mean, and and of course, it's not just Chicago. It's New York City. It's Minneapolis, Los Angeles. I mean, a lot of specialized. I mean, we're talking about like human trafficking task forces that are no longer staffed because they don't have the they have to pull resources from somewhere and so no one understandably no one wants to be a police officer right now because even if you do a justified action like the uh, like what happened with jacob blake right that was a justified police shooting at the time 
I thought it did look bad, the video, but I also thought it was like, okay, but what led up to that? You know, like what, it doesn't make sense for this guy to just pull up and just start plugging away at this guy in the back sometimes. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that, that makes sense in, you know, the BLM radical, all cops are, you know, point of view, mm-hmm. but within the rational point of view, it's like, okay, this, this, let's, let's look at what happened and let's look into what led to this moment. Um, and so, but obviously no one wants to go through a public, uh, spiel like that. Right. Mm-hmm. So no one wants to be a cop. Uh, I, I, as I was saying before, the Minneapolis police department, they are chartered for 900 officers. They have less than 500, uh, here in DC is, is kind of the same issue where I was, I was on a ride along with, uh, a police, uh, detective out in in the southeast D.C., Anacostia area. And what stuck out to me was when we walked out to the station's motor pool, it was just filled with cars, filled with police cars. And he's like, you see all this? And I said, yeah. He's like, yeah, because we don't have anybody to man them. Hmm. Like before, before we didn't have enough squad cars for, for people, but now we have we have too many. And and so now what's often happening over in southeast D.C. is just that cops, uh, they're by themselves in a squad on a corner waiting for a shooting to happen. And they, and they, they, they position themselves near the hot spots where typically stuff happens. And that's just so their response time is, is quick, but literally that's all they can do now over there. Um, and, and so, and, and then even with, uh, <laughs> well, and the, uh, the, the, after we had gotten to the detective's uh, vehicle, right before we got in, right down the street, pop, 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 pop. He's like, you hear that? I said, yeah, it's kind of hard to miss. And so it turned out, yeah, it was a female got shot. In that case, they recovered a rifle and they recovered a, uh, a handgun from from, from, that, from that scene. And that was just the one, obviously, uh, of many that have happened since then. And some of the strictest gun laws in the nation. Oh, yeah. By the way. Yeah. yeah. And still. Yeah. It's still, they, they, oh, they find a way. Yeah. yeah, surprisingly. So it's, and it's not just the fact that it's the police forces across the country that are having having the negative effects of what happened from 2020 but it's now and i'm sure you guys have talked about this and with some of your other guests but the 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 these district attorneys and these judges that just do not dole out justice they 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 let these people go who on little to no bail or you know they they bring down from felony charges to misdemeanors and so what do they what do they do? They then go out and commit even more egregious crimes. And it's just it's just dumbfounding to me that, you know, the the it, it's just it's just, you know, okay, we take what what happened to George Floyd, okay, that shouldn't have happened, but then we're gonna flip it to, okay, well then everybody is just gonna have ten chances. Um and so that that that's why that's why I wrote the book in part because it helps explain how we got here. Right, because it didn't happen overnight, and it, it didn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, people saw what they were able to get away with in 2020, and they were able to get away with a lot, unless you're Kyle Rittenhouse, right? And that took a while for him to get justice done in his, and you know, obviously his life is drastically altered. For, um, but if you, you know, loot, or even if you kill somebody, or if you, you know, do major property damage or attack somebody in in this BLM context, well, then okay. Go, go. <laughs> you know, mm. here's here's the door, and that's just not good because who are the victims of the, of these crimes, of these violent crimes, these shootings? It's black people, it's brown people. I mean, it's people that are the the people that, that are supposed to be protected f- by this movement, and yet this movement of this, they just they've made things worse, and they don't see it or they don't want to see it, and so they're going to continue pushing for these radical policies. And, and that's why I'm actually pretty surprised that, well, maybe I'm not so surprised, but I mean, George Gascon over in Los Angeles, his recall effort got w- failed. Um, you know, they really made sure they verified those signatures. And yeah, yeah. I, I kind of noticed that, but, yeah. um, but, but there's a reason for it. I mean, even for, I mean, the, the, the signatures got almost to a million, right? I mean, and we're talking about Los Angeles. So, I mean, this is not a conservative city by any stretch, but people are fed up. People are tired of seeing Loved ones getting killed by people who should have been in jail, or 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 seeing, uh, or just having to deal with this, this. It's it's this low intensity lawlessness. That's what's happening now. 
um, as opposed to the high intensity. And it's just, it's just, it's just constant, right? And because it's so low intensity, it's, it's, it's easier to manage, obviously to a certain extent, but it's easier to manage on that level. So that's why, you know, they, they don't have the urgency to, to, to clamp down on it as opposed to massive looting and destruction. You know, it's, it's harder to get a handle on these random smash and grabs, uh, or, or these, you know, spontaneous lootings that, that you see pop up in social media now. Um, just because they're hard to predict and just because um, they're able to get away quickly, quick, uh, more quickly. But so we're just in a tough spot. I, I, I know I'm not breaking any news by, by, by saying that, but as someone who, who saw the trajectory go that way from, like, from, the, from the on the ground view, it's just, it's just really sad because I think a lot of it is avoidable. A lot of it is, at least today, uh, it can be fixed. It's just that the people in position right now, they don't want to fix it because, well equity what's your theory of why the la riots didn't become something that was all over the country but this round did so i think it was for a couple of reasons uh probably social media number one uh, wasn't around uh but also number two we weren't uh we for 2020 we had covid and i mean that whole uncertainty that i think exacerbated a certain certain people's reactions but also just because we were in a very heated uh, presidential election um i think that was kind of the uh I, I think it was kind of like a you know building a fire right you need you need three things and so for 2020 to be as hectic as it was we had uh the election we had covid and then we had the spark which was which was george floyd so i think because i mean because there have been times post Der post the derek chauvin trial where I would, you know, there were more kind of controversial police actions. Maybe not saying that it was wrong, but you know, at the moment it was controversial. Where I would, where I, where I thought, okay, maybe I got to go to that city, and then nothing happens. Yeah. And so I think it's, so I think it's just that there was all these other factors at, 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 at play that made 2020 worse in terms of, in terms of the riots. So you know, maybe if we weren't in a presidential, maybe if there wasn't you know, people losing their jobs because of COVID and being cooped up in the house. I mean, that was half the reason why I went because I was tired of being in the house all the time. I was like, oh, hey, I have a reason to travel. I have a reason. Flying during that time was was so amazing. There was no, there was no <laughs> lines. The, the flights were cheap. But so I think I think that's why. Because, um, I mean, in, in 92, I mean, there were some protests kind of around the country, but I, I don't I don't think. And also just because you know what a lot of stuff has happened in terms of controversial police actions uh, since 92 right so i mean it, it builds up over time and even with minneapolis specifically there there was the Philando castile case there was a few other cases that were you know that were locally that weren't they didn't get the national attention so there from the activist standpoint there there are all you know george floyd was kind of the final straw because there was all these these other local cases uh that had already happened within you know the past within the 2010s uh, so uh, that's that's that was kind of the more you know micro, micro view of it. So I mean, it was, yeah, it was just I mean, it was, it was just a crazy year. Yeah, <laughs> it really was. Do you think that cities are more prepared or less prepared to deal with a riot like what happened in all these cities um, since since George Floyd? I I think the plans are better. To a certain extent, I think I think the, the 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 heightened awareness might be there to say, hey, we need to, you know, have X in place. We need to have Y in place should something like that happen. But the actual manpower to to clamp down on it is not. Uh, when I I was talking to uh, a Minneapolis police uh, department source uh, not too long ago. And I asked, and I I asked him that. I said, hey, let's say there's more riots like 2020 again. Like, can you guys handle that? He said, absolutely not. Like we would need the National Guard on day one, and obviously that's going to take time, um, and it's just because they don't have the manpower for that. So, I mean, it, it saps up so many resources because you have to have command and control. You need to have all these auxiliary, you know, supporting elements for the main forces to take down and stop people from setting things on fire and and, and mass looting and, and all this other stuff. So the 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 awareness and the plans that might be in place to better to better handle something like that but in terms of the actual manpower no they're not um at least at least some cities and so that's why it's concerning that we're gonna have to rely on the national guard 
should something like that happen. And, you know, when I look to the future, um, you know, the only thing that I can think of that can maybe spark something, maybe not to the same level, would be, you know, let's, let's just say Donald Trump winning the presidency. <laughs> uh, but, you know, and that's a ways off from now. And, and you know, that that's an, that's that's a that's an if. Um, but like I said, there, there, there are these things that I would thought, OK, if this did happen in 2020, there would have been a riot in in this city or, or or that city. But ever since the Derek Chauvin trial, where you know he was found guilty on everything, it just seemed like the air kind of got taken out of that. So, but like I said, but the the low intensity uh, aspect of it is still very much with us. Was there any city in America that has actually gotten more safe? Decided to go in the opposite direction on this stuff. Um. More safe? Uh, uh, well, in terms of major cities, no. At least not that I've seen. I mean, I think Boston, I think I've seen a decrease. Mm-hmm. It's either, it's, I think it's Boston or, or somewhere up in the, on the Northeast. But overall, no. I mean, and, and that's why, again, it, it's so frustrating because it could what happened to George Floyd could have been a more unifying moment mm-hmm. and there was for like a brief you know for a brief fleeting moment but then they, the 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 loudest voices and the people with a lot of support did take that and say okay so we're gonna defund the police we're gonna abolish I mean especially Minneapolis right they wanted to completely get rid of their department police department and it's just no that's insane <laughs> what are you what are you doing I mean you know you can't you know the overreaction and the, and the overcorrectiveness mm-hmm has really made things worse Mm -hmm. and and you know i don't i i think when we again when we look to the future you know i think things are going to get worse in terms of the quality of life the crime before things get better i mean there's a little bit of ray of hope with what happened in san francisco with uh cheza boudain the the district attorney getting recalled Mm -hmm. i mean that was kind of like okay maybe people are finally wising up and and saying that you know, these types of racial justice policies aren't aren't the best thing but yeah i i, I think uh we're i mean i've said it before but we're just we're just in a worse spot than than when we first started out in 2020 do you think that um that there actually is voter rebellion happening in these cities i mean the the sf thing is kind of weird because as far as i remember san francisco didn't really have very big riots vis-a-vis some of these other cities like seattle kenosha minneapolis etc do do you do you think this is actually a salient issue that people are voting on this election cycle i think so i mean because look i mean and we see this with like for example with latino vote right i mean the which has predominantly been for democrats but you know no matter what your ethnicity is you don't want to pay for higher gas prices you don't want to uh pay more uh, for just general goods that you pay for on a daily basis, and you don't like to be mugged when you're walking out the store. I mean, and, and especially by mugged by somebody who should be locked up but isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and and oh, and by the way, we don't like to be called Latinx either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I so but 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 broadly, I think it is because people. Um, I mean, I just just saw watching Tucker Carlson yesterday. Uh, the. Tucker played a uh, a local uh, news report from New York City where uh, I think it was the Chelsea neighborhood, and it was all the all these people who are not not Republicans, but they're complaining about the crime. They're complaining about uh, homeless people shooting up drugs and being aggressive and 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 you know making again the quality of life lower for people who do pay taxes. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think people are waking up to it. Uh, it's just a matter of whether or not it's going to be enough. To for them to maybe vote differently that especially in the you know the deep deep blue pockets but more across the country i think people are are seeing the 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 stupidity of what of this what we're doing what has it been like for you personally to be in these dangerous environments i mean you've gotten hurt before i believe that the uh the riot bullet was the most no yeah been injured before yeah tell us a little bit about that and how you've kind of you know kept yourself sane and thought through your own personal safety as you've gone into uh you know the closest thing to war journalism you can do inside the united states he doesn't think about his safety (laughs) so at the time i was just i was just like let's let's go full bore let's just do it yeah i mean that's basically what nick said it was just i mean my, my mom she told me that summer she said 
I'm not saying I'm not going to be sad because I will, but I'm saying if the cops come to my door and they say you died at one of these things, I'm not going to be surprised. Well, that's, <laughs> that, that's fair. Um, you, no, I mean, so at the time when things were, were just happening one right after the other, I didn't really have time to like process all of that. And so it didn't, it didn't start to happen until things started slowing down. And when things started slowing down, that's kind of when it kind of caught up to me. Um, I like I would like I would have these nightmares, um, and I would never dream before. Like I I I rarely I rarely dreamed uh, prior to all this, and but now all of a sudden like I was waking up in the middle of the night, like sweating, my heart was pounding, um, and so that that was that was kind of a hard thing to to kind of accept because you know coming from a marine background, um, you know I never deployed, I never uh, did anything like that with with the military, but. So, you know, from from my point of view, I was thinking like, well, I didn't go to Afghanistan or Iraq, you know, I, I, I just went to Kenosha, Wisconsin. And yeah, that was hectic. And yeah, that was stressful. But it was it's nothing like a war zone. So like, you know, like an actual war zone. So why am I feeling this way? You know, I shouldn't be feeling this way. And so it, it took me a while to accept that I even had post-traumatic stress. Um, that was... that I mean, and, and that was something that I dealt with, um, and even to this day, it's still kind of, you know, as time, time heals all, as I say. So I, I've gotten better uh, on a personal level. But one thing that I've noticed is just that I, I think I just got like addicted to that adrenaline rush because now today, I mean, when people always ask, when people ask me like, Hey, you know, who, how you doing? I, I just, I'm bored. <laughs> just, and I'm just being honest. Like, like I, I'm bored. I mean, covering the border, it's, a, it's, it's, it's good, you know. It's good. It's a good story to, to to go on, and and it's 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 important, but it's nothing like covering a riot. And so, um, you know, when I was in when I was in Chicago, covering the shootings, there was what, what what's become a trend over there is that basically there's all these guys in these cars, uh, and they just do donuts in an intersection. Well, the cops come. And they try to disperse the crowd and the crowd, because there's no fear of police anymore, the crowd basically just chases the, the cops away. They, they throw fireworks, they throw rocks, they, throw, they, they just, and so uh, that happened in the loop of all places. I mean, this is, you know, the, the heart of downtown, this is supposed to be the safest area. And so, and yeah, this is happening right here. And so I, uh, that was like the closest to a ride I've covered <laughs> in a very long time. And I just got, I just got that taste of that rush back for a little bit. I'm just thinking, you know, I was trying to savor it cause I knew <laughs> probably was going to happen again for a while, but it's, but it's just because, I mean, I mean, yeah, it's, it's cool. Um, you know, it's cool, you know, going on Fox news and, and talking about, you know, going to work and, you know, with the book, but you know, even if none of that were to happen, you know, if none of my tweets were to get any traction whatsoever, I would still go out and do it because I, I just, love being in this chaotic situation like it's 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 hard to describe uh why i but i just i just do and so when that goes away and then it's just back to the daily daily life of just you know i was covering a i was covering a uh an event in the capitol building about u.s taiwanese relationships and it's like okay, like, I, I I get why I get again I get why it's important to to cover this and 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 do all this, but like, doesn't exactly get the blood. Yeah, I just it. I'm like, what am I doing here? I I, I just so they need to send you to Kabul. <laughs> that so right and so in the town hall goes to Kabul. In, in the time in the time since since things have died down and you know so before I was dealing with the post traumatic stress and now I'm just more dealing with okay how do I just accept this boredom because it's going to be with me, right? Unless something were to happen again, again, maybe until 2024, 25. Okay, maybe. So you're hoping Donald Trump gets reelected. <laughs> Look, I, if he wins, he wins. So, and I, I will be around to cover the, the after effects. But yeah, so, you know, so well, how do I, you know, how do I, I don't want to say cope, but yeah, how do I cope? <laughs> I won't see. But uh, how do I cope with not having this adrenaline rush on, on a daily basis, right? And so that's something I've had to kind of work out because, I mean, with with Roe being overturned and that whole week, I mean, again, I, I wasn't trying to hype myself up or like trying to, uh, you know, emotionally, you yeah. know, get myself, you know, up up for nothing. But I was, people were saying, we're going to riot. I'm like, okay, 
I'll be here. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's finally overturned, and then nothing happened. Yeah. And, and, like, Un- unhappy cat ladies aren't really going to y- burn down CVSs. <laughs> well, right, exactly. So, But I'm like, but you promised. <laughs> like, you you guys were promising on social media. You even put up posters, and, and now nothing. And so, and obviously that's good, right? Because yeah. it is sad, and it's, it's heartbreaking to see people who had nothing to do with, like, say, bro being overturned, getting their business damage or anything like that but it's just then on that personal level for me it's just like okay well then w- what do i do now so yeah. that's something that i've had to kind of work out it was what was it that they were billing it as like the night of rage or whatever yeah and I, was, I was explaining something to my wife i'm like you know how like when you're angry and then a couple hours later you just forget about it <laughs> this is what that's gonna be like and i was right yeah. i was right it you're was right it was and, true. And, and it was also because i was upset because i was outside the supreme court all day because I didn't want to miss anything. Yeah, and then and then I was out there all night, and then it was so funny because the Antifa group did come out, and yeah. then they marched back to the Supreme Court, and they're like, "Okay, everyone, we're done. Everyone, get home safe." I'm like, "You guys were tearing up stuff." <laughs> night for, of rage. You night of like, uh, like like you guys were tearing up stuff two years ago, and now you're just like, "Okay, get home safe." It's just. Yeah. Like what's happened? You, like what happened to you guys? Have you thought about like sending yourself to the Ukraine for a for a? <laughs> for I, an I I did when when you know I, I know again like I don't care about like the the broader politics of it. Obviously, like I have my own kind of you know like okay, let's not let's stop sending billions of dollars just for a second, you know. Uh, but when it first when it first started, I was saying as a town hall, I'm like, hey, send me send me. Like, I wanna, <laughs> I go. again, I, I like I don't care whether or not we should be involved. I just I just want to cover I it. I want to go to the I, Ukraine. I want to go, and there were they, and so we they said no because for for a variety of reasons. So I thought, okay, insurance probably. It, yeah. <laughs> so, but no, it, it, it was so yeah. It I have I have tried you know other ways to kind of get that get that rush back, but and and that was that was a great thing because like prior to all this, I I never considered myself an adrenaline junkie, and like even like today. I hate going on roller coasters. I was at Six Flags with my friend, and he said, why are you scared of going on roller coasters? You go to riots. I'm like, okay, but at least I'm on the ground. Like, <laughs> I'm not being flung through the air at 100 miles per hour, uh, going in all different directions. But, but uh, skydiving, you know, bungee cord jumping, I wouldn't I wouldn't do that. Because it, it, I did go jet skiing recently in uh, Clearwater. Mm-hmm. And that was a little bit, it was a little <laughs> bit like where I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Like it was a little scary at first cause uh, you know, I never done it before yeah. and I'm going pretty fast over this thing. And it's kind of hard to keep it straight, but th- that was kind of close to being like, okay, like yeah. kind of getting a thrill of some kind. Yeah. I experienced this right around New Year's. My sister and I were jet skiing and like, it was not storming, but it was definitely not exactly still weather and going 50 miles an hour over the water slightly choppy water um i'm gonna chase that high for a long time (laughs) i remember this i was i think i was in honduras with my family for christmas or something and i got a text from you like i'm gonna buy one of these (laughs) i am gonna spend my entire salary to buy one of these you know having julio on the show reminds me of this um experience that i don't often think about or a story that i don't often get to tell uh from pre- just pre-American moment days when you and I had a meeting at, what was it? The Hey Adams, we were meeting on the rooftop. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, this was before we launched, but we were like, right? It was before we launched. We were working on American moment. You were visiting. Mm-hmm. And so I, as always, you know, get to, get to the meeting at a, oh, at, yeah, a, yeah. at a at a punctual time. And you, as always, are late. And uh, <laughs> there's... Like this, you know, they had taken Black Lives Matter Plaza or whatever they call it. Um, And right as you show up was when they started like throwing bottles and stuff at police and they fired tear gas and they're all starting to close in. And I'm standing up on the on the balcony and I'm looking down and I see this like bespeckled Indian man in a suit just like making a beeline with his head down through all these people like (laughs) rioting um, and somehow miraculously make it into the building it was an amazing sight yeah Um, it rocked yeah Um, Julio where can people keep up with everything that you're doing where can they buy your book uh, so they can buy it where, wherever books are sold. It includes Amazon, but it's more. I understand if you don't want to give it to Amazon any money, but uh, you know Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, Thrift Books. Uh, I have I have links on my website, holyrosas dot com. But uh, for uh, just daily stuff, you can you know, go to Town Hall, Townhall dot com. Uh, where do people follow you on Twitter? Uh, Julio underscore Rosas eleven. Wonderful. Well, thank you for everything that you do, and thank you for coming on the podcast. Yeah, appreciate it. 
hopefully you guys enjoyed that and i highly recommend continuing to follow julio's work if something weird goes down in an american city chances are you can keep up with basically everything you need to to know about it by going to julio's twitter feed i've certainly done that many nights when uh when things are getting chippy out there uh, he's kind of like uh those reporters that you follow only for election nights he's he's your riot night uh reporter um so be sure to uh check everything he's uh, written out by his book uh and go to americanmoment.org to keep up with everything that we're doing be sure to rate and review this podcast five stars it really does help us get more cool guests i think this is like the mid 70s in terms of which episode uh it is of this podcast we've got a ton of uh backlog content and we really enjoy bringing it to you guys every week thank you for listening and we'll see you guys next week moment of truth is an american moment studios production filmed at the conservative partnership center our podcast is produced and edited by jake mercier and jared cummings Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.